Hi, I'm Dr. Birkowski. Uh, this is an old lecture of mine from the days when I was lecturing in physiology at the University of Pretoria. Um, this here is a copy of a lecture I gave to um, second year medical students on immunity. And I thought it would be worthwhile to upload it on the internet in case someone else might find it useful. I hope you enjoy it. So basically the immune system exists in order to deal death and destruction to pathogens. And what is a pathogen? Well, pathogen um, with path meaning disease and gen meaning the cause is basically anything that causes a disease. And it's usually something that's not part of the human body. <coughs> And uh, the u pathogens come in various sort of flavors and types. Um, the usual culprits, um, uh, there's a list, I'm going to go through a list of them on this slide and the next slide. But starting off with viruses, um, organisms that lack cell walls, and they also lack independent uh, metabolic processes. In other words, in order to survive or in order to replicate, they need to hijack host cells. Uh, so they actually invade normal tissue and hijack its DNA and RNA replication mechanisms. That's a virus. Um, and then bacteria uh, contain all the mechanisms inside them for replication, so they don't really need to invade a cell, as it were. So they're generally um, capable of independent life to some extent. <coughs> and um, interestingly enough, there are about 10,000 more bacteria cells in our bodies than human cells. So we actually, um, every human being is basically a walking petri dish uh, with a massive amount of bacteria living within us. Um, <coughs> so like we live on planet Earth, these bacteria live on you know, planet body. And most of the bacteria are harmless and many of them are actually helpful to us, uh, but on occasion bacteria have uh, uh, become parasitic or even harmful. Uh, to us and therefore they become pathogenic. Fungi are cellular organisms like bacteria and they're also capable of independence but uh, they have chitinous uh, cell membranes and the nuclei are also enclosed in a membrane so that, uh, that by, uh, by that definition they are eukaryotes whereas bacteria are mostly prokaryotes. Um, and like bacteria, they colonize the human body and they're usually harmless, but on occasion can cause skin infections or uh, sometimes even severe disease, especially in immunosuppressed patients, like for example those with AIDS. What last uh, item on the list for this slide are your worms um, and uh, other parasites. Um, these are creatures that have to have a host during at least part of their life cycle. Um, and uh, they compete with the host for resources. Um, they therefore have a parasitic relationship with the human body. The next type of pathogen is the ectoparasite, and that is parasites that live on our skin, such as mites, ticks, lice, and fleas. Um, when they bite into the skin, there are immune system reactions to these creatures when they bite. And in animals, um, some scientists have even been able to develop vaccines against certain types of ticks and lice, um, basically by vaccinating animals um, uh, against certain species of ticks and lice. Um, they do get such a strong immune response against uh, a bite from those creatures, from those ectoparasites, that the ectoparasites decide they'd rather go and try and eat something else. Um, there aren't any vaccines like that uh, in humans, um, but whenever a mosquito bites you or a tick bites you, there will be some sort of uh, immune system reaction um, to that proboscis that's digging through your skin uh, in order to try and drive it off and irritate uh, the little creature so it can go bite something else. Tumor cells or cancer cells, those are cells that um, used to be normal human cells, uh, but they m have mutated and they therefore develop a parasitic relationship with the human body. Um, if they become invasive and they invade normal tissue and spread through the body, destroying normal tissue, and then that, that, um, uh, that is then defined as cancer. And the immune system 
has ways of defending itself against these cells that have mutated and have rebelled, as it were, against the human body. An allergen is any substance that can trigger off an allergic immune reaction. Um, <coughs> so that's a specific type of immune reaction that we'll uh, touch on uh, later on in this presentation. And generally, an allergy is, to, is usually to inert substances like dust or bee venom or iodine. Um, but you can also get allergies. You can also be allergic to living organisms. You can be allergic to mites. Um, you might even be allergic to bacterial to bacteria, um, switch uh, or viruses. Um, although that's uh, much rarer than um, allergies to simple inert substances. And finally, foreign tissue. Um, if you put a bit of someone else's body into yourself, you will have an immune reaction. That can happen with blood transfusions or transplants of organs, like a kidney transplant. And even if you need that blood or you need that kidney, the immune system th is not really wired to be able to tell the difference between good foreign tissue and bad foreign tissue, and therefore it will attack foreign tissue anyway. And that's why organ transplant recipients, on those, those who received organ transplants, usually have to have the um, immunosuppressive drugs to suppress immune system activity. Otherwise, you get a phenomenon called rejection, where the immune system attacks the transplanted organ um, and destroys it uh, when you really you want that organ working for as long as possible. Last thing I want to mention in terms of pathogens that sometimes, uh, due to an accident or a quirk, the immune system will start seeing normal tissue, normal human tissue, as uh, pathogenic, and therefore the immune system will start attacking normal tissue. This is this happens, for example, in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, where the immune system starts uh, attacking um, a person's joints. Um, um, as if uh, those joints were disease-causing entities, when in reality um, it actually just makes everything worse. And therefore, rheumatoid arthritis people get these swollen joints because of the immune system attacking their own uh, bodies. And we refer to this as an autoimmune reaction. Right, so the immune system defends us against these, um, all these different pathogens. And we're pretty much exposed to new pathogens on a daily basis, whether it be new chemicals or new bacteria or viruses. And uh, the immune system therefore constantly works to defend us against um, uh, these things causing disease. And the immune system is actually um, a term that includes many different types of cells and proteins and organs that work together um, as a system to defend the human body. And um, the immune system components are specially concentrated in the lymphatic system, uh, which is a system of circulation of lymph fluid through the body that also filters through lymph nodes. I'm not going to go into details on that. That's, um, that is basic anatomy. Um, but um, basically just wanted to mention that um, the lymphatic system is part of the immune system, certainly, although there are certain structures that also can be included within the immune system, so um, on top of the, uh, the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is not the be-all and the end-all of the immune system. So the next few slides, we're going to um, go through all the immune system components one by one, um, and then after having gone through all the components, we'll then discuss immune reactions, basically discussing how the immune components work together. Okay, so we know immune system cells concentrate in the lymphatic system, so it's worthwhile having a good idea what the lymphatic system is about. Uh, basically, a network of vessels throughout the body, and um, included in this definition of the lymphatic system is the lymph fluid found within this network of vessels and also lymphatic organs and tissues. And it's in these organs and tissues where immune system cells are especially concentrated. Lymphatic system also has roles in fluid balance and uh, fat absorption or lipid absorption. I'm not going to go into the details of that. This is an immunology lecture. And uh, in terms of uh, immunity, the functions of the lymphatic system are to filter uh, fluid, uh, specifically fluid that it collects from tissue, uh, pick up potential pathogens uh, from the tissue, 
send them with, with the fluid um, into lymph nodes and there's usually very high concentrations of immune system cells in the lymph nodes so they can zap the pathogens in the lymph nodes. The lymphatic organs themselves, uh, we can divide them into primary, secondary and support structures. The primary lymphatic organs are those areas where immune system cells mature and those come from an immature form into a mature form and that would be the red bone marrow and the thymus. Uh, the thymus doesn't just mature immune system cells, it also secretes some hormones that influence T cells, um, which we won't go into uh, detail for the sake of this um, lecture. The secondary uh, lymphatic organs are where the immune system cells migrate to after maturing, so after they're sort of born in the red bone marrow or born in the thymus, they then immigrate to live in the lymph nodes or the tonsils of the spleen, and then um, structure that's not really considered to be a lymphatic organ but does support the uh, immune system and lymphatic system is the liver in the sense that it makes many proteins that are involved in immune system activity such as um, complement uh, proteins uh, which we'll discuss a bit later on. So the types of immune system cells and immune system proteins that we're going to discuss are the leukocytes or the white blood cells uh, lymphocytes, which are actually a type of leukocyte, and talk about mast cells, which are involved in your allergic reactions and your initiation of inflammation. Uh, we're going to have a look, brief look at some antimicrobial proteins, specifically the interferons and the complement proteins. We're going to discuss the concept of the antigen presenting cell. Uh, we're going to talk about cytokines, which are molecules secreted by immune system cells, and we're going to talk about antibodies, which are made by B cells. So firstly, let's discuss the leukocytes, or the white blood cells. There are five different types. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, macrophages, lymphocytes. Um, with macrophages, we can also lump the monocytes with that uh, group, since monocytes are basically just young macrophages. So starting with the neutrophils, neutrophils um, are white blood cells that, wa that wander around the body looking for bacteria to kill. And there are various mechanisms whereby they can kill bacteria. They can kill them by phagocytosis. Phagocytosis basically being a process where one cell surrounds something, uh, like another cell or a molecule, creates a vesicle and basically sucks that vesicle into itself and then digests it um, by releasing uh, digestive enzymes into that vesicle. Neutrophils can uh, also um, kill bacteria through respiratory burst and what happens is that neutrophils have um, lysosomes which are filled with um, certain enzymes and um, or granules of enzymes and they can degranulate uh, these lysosomes and release them into the area around them and these enzymes and catalyze a reaction uh, that creates a lot of free radicals or superoxides can also create hydrogen peroxide and can also uh, create hypochlorite which is basically a type of bleach and all these chemicals are quite quite toxic so uh, by creating all these chemicals around the neutrophil it, uh, the neutrophil basically uh, creates a chemical kill zone um, as it were, and this uh, um, then kills anything uh, which, th which the chemicals are in contact with. Unfortunately, the neutrophil often dies uh, in the process as well, so it's basically a, a suicide bombing mission, as it were. And normal tissue can also be damaged, therefore neutrophils can also contribute to autoimmune damage. Eosinophils are mostly in the mucous membranes, so unlike neutrophils which are all over the body, eosinophils are mostly mucous membranes and they're especially active against parasites and allergens. Um, they fight parasites by creating su superoxides and hydrogen peroxide um, like the neutrophil. They also secrete special toxins that damage parasites such as neurotoxin and they also secrete cytokines which are chemicals to talk to other cells and uh, through the cytokine production they promote the activity of basophils and mast cells. Um, they're also able to f um, undergo phagocytosis um, if there are antibodies helping them out and therefore cinephils are mostly involved with the, in allergens in terms of this process but if an antibody binds to an allergen the cinephil can then phagocytose uh, that antigen antibody um, complex.
Eosinophils can also suppress inflammation um, by su um, secreting enzymes that uh, suppress inflammatory chemicals and uh, through this mechanism they also help to uh, prevent too much autoimmune damage from the other uh, white blood cells. Basophils um, mostly just secrete chemicals, they don't attack um, uh, pathogens directly. They secrete leukotrienes uh, which activate neutrophils and eosinophils and uh, stimulates them to work. Uh, histamine which is um, uh, a vasodilator causes more blood to flow into the area and heparin um, which is an anticoagulant which prevents blood clotting uh, in that area that, uh, where blood is pooling from the histamine release. Macrophages are grown up monocytes so when you have a monocyte in a red band marrow it um, eventually migrates to connective tissue and becomes various types of macrophages so there's different types of macrophages depending on what tissue you're looking at and often they have different names depending on the tissue that they're in but they're all uh, in the broad class of macrophages um, some, of macro some macrophages will wander around the body like neutrophils but some macrophages are fixed in their tissue and stuck in a certain position uh, and they cannot move and macrophages pretty much mostly work via phagocytosis, so they do have the ability to secrete some chemicals, uh, which we'll briefly touch on. Lymphocytes uh, are divided into three groups, uh, natural killer cells, T cells, and B cells, and I'll discuss them in a bit more detail on the next slide, because uh, um, especially with T cells and B cells, you need to know them quite well to understand the body's immune uh, system reactions. So in terms of the lymphocytes, we have three of them. Uh, natural killer cells are like neutrophils in the sense that they roam around the body um, constantly on patrol and they look for foreign cells or cancer cells and when they de detect uh, uh, that kind of cell, they'll then bind to the cell and um, basically punch it. They punch a hole through its cell membrane uh, by secreting a protein called perforin. Uh, perforin causes a hole to form in the cell membrane of the enemy and then after that hole has been formed natural killer cells will then um, secrete um, granzymes int, uh, into that cell through the hole and these granzymes are digestive enzymes so they literally eat the cell from the inside out. In terms of T lymphocytes they are the subdivided into uh, four main types so that the other types of T lymphocytes, so these are not the only four types, um, but for the sake of this lecture we're going to focus on only the four main types, being the helper CD4 cells, um, the cytotoxic CD8 cells, and um, the T regulatory cells and the T memory cells. Helper cells um, stimulate um, the CD8 cells and the B lymphocytes. The cytotoxic cells uh, are the ones that actually do the damage, so um, the helper cells stimulate the cytotoxic cells to f uh, attack a pathogen um, and um, CD8 cells work in a similar way to natural killer cells in the sense that they pour out uh, perforin to punch holes in the membrane, granzymes to digest it from the inside out, they also secrete interferons um, which interfere with viral replication and tumor necrosis factor uh, which um, encourages cancer cells to die off quickly um, um, basically activates their own self-destruct mechanisms regulatory cells uh, are a type of T-cell that um, suppress the other T-cells preventing them from being overactive this uh, helps prevent autoimmune reactions and then memory cells um, are T cells that attack only a specific pathogen to which they have been uh, um, programmed uh, to attack. B lymphocytes, um, their only function is basically to make antibodies and we'll go over how that hap uh, happens um, on a later slide. So let's take a pause for a moment and discuss what what is the importance of knowing these things in terms of your clinical practice as medical doctors? So as doctors you're going to from time to time order something called a full blood count on your patients which is um, and part of that full blood count might be a white cell differential where they measure the white cells and then they measure every single type of white cell uh, to see which one is high, which one is normal, which one is low. Uh, 
Now, uh, if a patient has more of a bacterial infection, it's going to need an antibiotic, they will tend to have high neutrophil counts because neutrophil counts uh, tend to go up. In other words, uh, the body makes more neutrophils um, as a response to a bacterial infection. In the presence of an allergen, um, eosinophils get activated and migrate into the bloodstream and therefore eosinophil counts might go arise uh, or basophil counts might also arise because basophils are responsible for the histamine release. So allergies may present with a high eosinophil count or high basophil count. Um, and in anaphylactic shock, sometimes it might be difficult to decide whether this patient is in shock because of an allergy or bacterial infection or, what other or some other reason. And um, or the full blood count can point you in the right direction. Um, patients with parasitic infections will tend to have high eosinophil counts. Um, so if a patient with uh, worms in the stomach, for example, um, having some sort of mysterious abdominal pains, you're not sure what's happening, a full blood count of a high eosinophil count will point you out, uh, will sort of point you in the direction or maybe this patient has some intestinal parasites. Some parasites also stimulate macrophages, so you'll have a high monocyte count with some types of parasitic infection. Uh, viral infections, on the other hand, tend to be mostly handled by your um, B cells and your T cells. So they will tend to um, cause um, high lymphocyte counts, and as the body will stimulate lymphocyte production in response to a viral infection. And um, the process of um, raising these uh, counts of neutrophils or basophils or what have you is a process called leukopoiesis and it's stimulated by colony stimulating factors so um, uh, that's not something I'm going to go into in detail um, but uh, these these raise raisings of uh, uh, blood levels of white blood cells can happen within hours of the beginning of the pathogenic process so um, even within the process of two hours, for example, of after a bacterial infection, you might have um, already a high neutrophil count, especially if it's a very severe infection, as an example. Antibodies are small um, molecules made by B lymphocytes. Um, we also call them immunoglobulins. Um, globulin because they have a round um, shaped structure in the middle of them. Um, making them the so-called globulin protein. And that's not important to remember. Um, and we divide them into several subgroups, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin D, immunoglobulin E, immunoglobulin G, and immunoglobulin M. Um, basically, the, the letters uh, represent a certain part of this structure. So immunoglobulin A have an alpha chain, immunoglobulin D has a delta chain, Immunoglobulin E is an epsilon chain, immunoglobulin G is a gamma chain, and immunoglobulin M is a mu chain. But the Greek um, the Greek names of these letters are hardly ever used, so A, D, E, G, M is more than adequate. And how do they work? There's four main ways of working. Um, they can either bind uh, to the molecule or the organism in question, and can actually bind to all their active sites. Um, it's almost basically like handcuffing them. So if I had to handcuff your hands, I neutralize your hands. The immunoglobulins do something similar. They bind to active sites, preventing almost handcuffing the molecule or the organism in question. They can also help complement. Uh, they can force complement to stick to pathogens. And by making that sort of complement antibody complex on the pathogen cell wall, it um, helps with opsonization. And opsonization is basically the process whereby uh, phagocytosis is initiated. So that trigger for phagocytosis we refer to as opsonization. So with that complement antibody complex on the pathogen um, surface, uh, phagocytes are then uh, encouraged to, to eat them, to phagocytose that pathogen. Um, if you want a dumb way of remembering, you can think of it as that um, the complement and the antibodies are making the pathogen nice and tasty, you know, putting a bit of salt there and some pepper and some herbs to make it nice and tasty for the phagocyte to, to eat um, the pathogen. And this is referred to as complement fixation. 
Another way antibodies work is through agglutination, which is literally when cells are glued together. So they can force cells, um, like pathogenic cells, to be stuck together in one giant sort of gluey, almost spider web uh, type structure. Um, not really a spider web structure, I'm just using a metaphor there. Uh, but basically, you know, all the cells get stuck together, unable to move, unable to do their thing, and therefore they're trapped in one place, and that makes it easier for immune systems the cells to go in and attack them and also makes it more difficult for those pathogens to go around looking for food and nutrition and uh, doing their thing. In the same way, uh, molecules can be stuck together through the process of precipitation, uh, preventing molecules from running uh, around, running amok around the body and wreaking havoc um, by causing the molecules that will be stuck together, they cannot move around and then the immune system cells can come in and clean them up. Immunoglobulin D and immunoglobulin E also have the ability to um, bond with immune system cells and can alter their functioning uh, in some ways. I'd like to point out at this point that uh, those five groups of antibodies are the main groups and each group does have subgroups. Um, um, so there's different types of IgA and IgD, etc., etc. Uh, but we're not going to go into that level of detail for the sake of this course. So there are chemicals in the bloodstream that are pr um, uh, proteins by nature and they have um, um, immune system uh, functions. So they're not really cells but they form part of the immune system. And generally uh, they mainly provide short term resistance to pathogens and especially infectious pathogens, pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. So they're not really involved for example in the allergic response. First one is the interferon. Interferons are um, um, they interfere with replication, and they specifically interfere with viral replication, and they can also interfere with cancer cell replication. Uh, so they have antiviral, anti-cancer properties, and they're generally triggered off. Um, by infected cells. So uh, if a cell in your throat, for example, is infected with a virus, it will then, um, as a reflex, uh, start pumping out interferons, both to um, defend itself uh, from the virus and also that the interferons can soak into the other cells ne next to it to um, give them a bit of um, antiviral resistance before the virus has a chance to spread. Complement proteins, uh, we'll discuss a bit more detail um, uh, in uh, a slide to come. Uh, it's a f basically, the, uh, there are proteins that have multiple capabilities and um, functions, but as I said, we'll go into a bit more detail on a later slide. Antimicrobial peptides. Um, these are basically natural, sort of homegrown antibiotics made by the body um, and they have various modes of action. Some of them can only attack a specific type of bacteria. Some of them have broad spectrum properties. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of more detail regarding them for the sake of this lecture. Uh, basically all I need to you to know is that these are um, natural antibiotics created uh, by the human body um, and there is some research go going on to see whether we cannot synthesize these antimicrobial peptides to actually use them as antibiotics in a pill form. Although if that does happen, it's still some years to come. Let's discuss the complement um, system in detail. Complement system being the name given to all these complement proteins and how they work together and obviously it's a part of the immune system. So complement proteins, um, there's more than 30 of them. Um, in fact, um, new ones are being discovered at times and at times it's been found that what's supposed to have been a new one is actually a different version of an old one. So the number always varies a little bit depending on the latest research, but it's more than 30. Um, exact number um, I can't give you. And they're made in the liver and therefore this is the liver's um, sort of a major contribution by the liver to immunity. And the main way that it works is by assisting um, antibodies, although it does have other methods of, uh, of action. The, the assisting antibody part was the first sort of function that was discovered, and that's why it's called a complement uh, protein, because it's, uh, it's said that its function complements antibodies.
So what happens is that you have inactive complement proteins made in the liver and then put, dumped into the blood and they circulate and then um, they eventually split up. Either they've been activated um, or they've um, spontaneously broken down. And the m famous example that's pretty much in every talk textbook is um, complement 3 or C3 uh, which activates and splits into two molecules C3A and C3B. Now some molecules of complement can split into many more um, fragments uh, than, than the, these two and um, so don't think that all of them just split into two fragments, some of them split into uh, ten or more fragments. But there's three ways to activate a complement protein. Um, either they're activated by the antibody, so the antibody sticks on the pathogen and then um, the complement sticks on the antibody and that is referred to as a complement pathway or complement fixation. They can also spontaneously break down in the bloodstream which is called an autocatalytic reaction um, or they may be activated by lectin. Lectin being a protein that binds to sugars on cell membranes or um, otherwise on the pathogen surface and then the complement binds to the lectin and that can activate that way and that's called the lectin pathway. And there's different ways that complement works. Uh, first of all it can trigger inflammation. So it can stimulate mast cells and basophils to secrete histamine and other pro-inflammation molecules. Um, and it can also attract neutrophils and macrophages to that area of inflammation. Um, the second method is called immune clearance, whereby um, those antibody pathogen complexes um, will then stick to blood cells through the process of agglutination. And by sticking them together, um, to the red blood cell and they almost piggyback on the red blood cell and then they are transported and they eventually end up either in the liver and spleen and in the liver and spleen we have large pools of macrophages which basically patrol the red blood cells and um, destroy um, pathogens um, as they are detected. Complements can also assist with phagocytosis um, by to, um, in order to help um, opsonization. Um, and then the last method is cytolysis, um, whereby different complement molecules can form a ring, and this ring is called the membrane attack complex, sometimes shortened to MAC. And this membrane attack complex works much like the perforin secreted by um, um, natural killer cells in the sense that they punch holes into pathogen cell walls. Um, and because they have holes in the uh, cell walls, all their contents leak out, and hopefully that will kill them. So let's go through the classical example of a complement cascade, focusing on the one that all the textbooks mention, complement 3 or C3. Um, it's released by the liver, released uh, or synthesized by the liver and released into the bloodstream. And then through one of these three processes, it breaks apart um, into C3A and C3B. Now C3A will then have its own effects, and what it does, it stimulates basophils, stimulates mast cells, um, Basophils and mast cells secrete histamine, so you're going to have histamine release. It's a pro-inflammatory molecule, so it's going to stimulate neutrophils and macrophages to come in, and that's going to result in a process of inflammation. C3B binds um, antigen pathogen complexes to red blood cells, in other words, it forces them to piggyback on red blood cells um, all the way to the liver or the spleen, and then the phagocytes will destroy them, and that process is called immune clearance. C3B can also make bacteria and viruses um, tasty uh, for phagocytosis. In other words, it helps uh, with opsonization, tr tr uh, triggering off process of phagocytosis. And C3B can also trigger off a reaction called um, cytolysis. Um, in other words, uh, it uh, can trigger off a reaction creating a membrane attack complex. So what it does, um, C3B will cause C5 to split into C5A and C5B. C5B uh, then sticks to C6, C7, C9, forming a ring shaped uh, structure. That, that's the membrane attack complex, and that will punch holes in the cell walls of pathogens. Okay, let's discuss interferons in a bit more detail. Um, so interferons bind to the surface of normal cells, and they trigger off um, the production of antiviral proteins in the, cel in the cell. These antiviral proteins um, inhibit uh, the replication of viruses and thus prevent viruses from making more viruses. And they also um, break down viral genes, hopefully killing the virus in the process.
but that's not all they do. They can also bind to natural killer cells and macrophages, um, upregulating their activity, and that basically um, encourages them to to be more active to destroy infected cells and to find infected cells in the first place. Um, natural killer cells also are able to attack cancer cells, so interferons in the presence of cancer um, can also activate those natural killer cells to destroy cancer cells. Interferons are released by cells that are um, either being infected by the virus themselves or being destroyed by the cancer. Um, this uh, will protect the cells around the damaged cell. Uh, unfortunately, because of the activation of natural killer cells and macrophages, this often means that um, the actual cell releasing the interferon has actually tagged itself for destruction because all these natural killer cells and macrophages are going to be almost like bees swarming to um, a coke can while you're having a picnic. Um, um, or like flies coming in f uh, to the row in your picnic. They all just swarm on this poor little cell uh, um, that's secreting the interferon and often the cell will end up being destroyed by the natural killer cells and macrophages um, because it's uh, b been releasing so much interferon. Next up we'll discuss cytokines. Um, cytokines are chemicals that cells use to communicate with one another. If you think about hormones, um, if one part of the body wants to influence the uh, functioning of another part of the body, it will secrete a hormone. Well, it's a similar concept. If one cell wants to influence another cell uh, that might be some distance away from it, it will re release a cytokine. So it's like a hormone but much smaller in scale. Um, Cells can sometimes reabsorb their own cytokines, therefore influencing their own behavior, uh, although in general it's to influence the behavior of other cells. Um, and there's a whole massive list of cytokines and potential cytokines that I don't want to um, sort of information overload you with. We're just going to touch on the sort of the most important um, known cytokines. Um, but the ones that you should know are the interferons, which um, we discussed a bit earlier, um, um, which does have some cytokine functions. Um, as mentioned previously, can influence macrophages and natural killer cells in terms of their function, therefore it has a cytokine-like uh, ability. Um, interleukins, which are mostly s secreted by white blood cells to influence other immune system cells uh, and can, can also influence other organs. Uh, leukotrienes, another type of cytokine, and tumor necrosis factor, uh, which is a molecule released both by well, immune system cells and by uh, damaged normal tissue. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a cytokine that um, triggers off cell death, um, so especially in terms of cancer, it encourages cancer cells to commit suicide, uh, in other words, to trigger off their own cell death, uh, a process known as apoptosis. I want to briefly uh, discuss fever as an immune system reaction. Um, in the presence of pathogen, the, uh, the hypothalamus of the brain can be stimulated to raise body temperature above 37 degrees Celsius, and that increased temperature can promote um, the activity of your interferon. Um, it accelerates tissue repair, and also most viruses and bacteria that are sort of um, have evolved to infect the human body are most comfor comfortable at a temperature of 36.4. So by raising the body temperature, it's almost like you're baking the virus, viruses and bacteria. They're very uncomfortable at the higher temperature, and it inhibits their own activity. And fever is caused by molecules that act on the hypothalamus of the brain. Uh, these molecules um, are called pyrogens. A lot of pyrogens are actually cytokines. So the most famous cytokine that can cause fever is interleukin-1, which is um, secreted by pretty much all the immune system cells as part of the activity uh, when they are activated. So if um, macrophage is busy phagocytosing or T helper T cells busy helping, chances are at some point interleukin-1 is going to be released, that interleukin-1 is going to go to the brain, and you're going to get a fever. Um, and then the process of fever is often accompanied by chills, flushes, and sweats. So it's not only a warm uh, uh, body temperature. Um, um, the chill 
is due to vasoconstriction. Um, that's when uh, the body forces blood away from the skin. Uh, by forcing blood away from the skin, it prevents heat from being lost from the skin uh, into the environment. Unfortunately, because the skin has so little blood going to it, the skin feels cold. Um, although internal heat is building up, especially within the chest and abdominal area, um, because all the blood is pooling there and not being allowed to um, r release heat into the environment. Once enough heat builds up, then um, the body needs to release that he heat that's built up to prevent you from overflow, uh, overwarming yourself. So then uh, all those blood vessels dilate, and then you feel, and then the skin becomes hot and red and flushed um, for that warm blood going to the skin. And then um, if that is not enough to keep the body temperature from uh, rising too high, um, every now and then uh, you will also sweat um, in order to cool yourself down. So that's why, although fever is a process where the body temperature is raised and rising, um, um, that's, uh, these are the sort of things that can cause a person, that even though the core temperature is rising, they can still uh, feel cold and sweaty, um, and they can often have a swinging sort of uh, picture where they get chills and fevers and chills and fevers, um, because um, it's the body keeping, um, keeping the temperature up or down as necessary. So just some quick clinical insights regarding fever. Um, Viral infection generally does not stimulate as much cytokine production or as much pyrogen uh, production, and therefore fevers of viral infection tend to be below 38 degrees. Bacterial infection, however, tends to cause fevers, um, tends to stimulate a lot of cytokine release, so fevers tend to be above 38.5 degrees. This is not always true, but it's a rule of thumb. Um, and generally, if you have a person with a 39 degrees Celsius temperature, for example, you need to carefully think about your diagnosis before you say, oh, it's just a virus or a flu, because generally high fever means bacterial infection. Um, the problem being that, especially in private practice, most patients take will take something for pain or fever, like Panado or Disprin, um, before coming to see the doctor. And these medications will um, counteract the effect of pyrogens in the hypothalamus, therefore causing a drop in the uh, body temperature, therefore causing a loss of that fever response. And the vast majority of patients, even in the presence of raging bacterial infections, are probably going to have a normal temperature in the consulting room because they always self-medicate just before arriving to your consulting room. And children especially uh, respond very well to anti-fever medications and uh, parents are often very eager to pump them full of medication. So a child can have a serious bacterial infection uh, and have an absolutely normal temperature um, because they've been pumped with Panado syrup. Um, and that is something to remember and keep in mind in private practice, and especially if you uh, ever go into emergency medicine, um, that's sometimes very almost uh, um, deathly ill children can present with a normal temperature despite having a raging bacterial infection. Um, that said, although the temperature goes down, other signs of fever like chills, flushes and sweats might be present. Um, what I've noticed, especially in private practice, uh, although this only works with white children unfortunately, is that um, uh, these ch kids will often have a bright red face, um, even uh, if the temperature is normal after being given panada, because they still have a bit of that flush response with blood being f uh, flushed um, to the surface of the skin. Uh, and so when you see that, you can say, oh, the child's been having fevers, even if the temperature is normal, because the mom has just pumped the child full of panada syrup. I've mentioned a few times before the concept of inflammation. I think it's important. Um, not to just assume that you guys know what inflammation is, but let's go through inflammation. What is the definition? What are the basics of inflammation that I need you to know? <coughs> By definition, inflammation is a local tissue response, although uh, I must say in some cases it can be very, very widespread, almost generalized, but in, in general, usually it's a localized tissue response. It's either in the throat or in the nose or in the chest or in the toe in a specific spot. And um, it's characterized by redness, uh, by swelling. Um, the area is warm and the area tends to be painful. Or the pain um, that can be a bit variable because different people have different pain tolerances and also a lot of people self-medicate with pain medication so sometimes the pain is not so obvious. Uh, the reason the body can 
uh, undergo inflammation is because it has a couple of benefits such as limiting the spread of pathogens um, it also um, uh, helps to destroy pathogens, it removes damaged tissue, and can also kickstart tissue repair. And generally, inflammation is triggered uh, when immune system cells start pouring out pro-inflammatory molecules, in other words, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And inflammation involves three processes. Uh, first of all, mobilization of body defenses, uh, containment, containment and destruction of pathogens and then the last stage tissue repair and debris removal will go through each stage uh, one by one on the next few slides. Just want to uh, quickly go through all the different triggers of inflammation. You see most of these um, triggers of inflammation are actually cytokines and those immune system activity will then stimulate inflammation. Um, for example your leukotrienes, um, your interleukins, um, are released by immune system cells. Um, but let's go through the other ones. Prostaglandins and thrombozane, uh, these are molecules released by damaged tissue. So whenever tissue is damaged, they can in and of themselves trigger off inflammation. Um, aspirin and your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs work by suppressing prostaglandin formation, thereby suppressing inflammation. Uh, and that's why um, they, are an they have those anti-inflammatory properties. Um, Platelet activating factor and thrombin um, are both released whenever blood has to clot. Thrombin is actually a clotting factor. Platelet activating factor is released whenever platelets um, are making a little platelet plug. Therefore, wherever there's bleeding, there will always be um, inflammation following it, uh, which makes sense. Uh, sense that. Um, in the wild, if you are bleeding, it's probably because you've injured yourself or something has bitten you, and um, all those bacteria have been introduced into your body, so therefore um, bleeding is automatically interpreted by the body as being um, um, that um, the skin has been broken, there's a source of infection coming in, we need to fight off any infection. Bradykinin is also released by normal tissue uh, to stick off inflammation. Um, and then histamine is released by basophils and mast cells and histamine is the main cause of inflammation of your allergic reactions therefore most of your medications that work against um, allergies um, actually are antihistamines um, they either block the histamine molecule or they prevent histamine being released complement in and of itself some types of complement fragments can trigger off inflammation Tumor necrosis factor uh, released um, in the presence of cancers can also trigger off inflammation. And then free radicals um, can also trigger off inflammation. So, uh, for example, those neutrophils, um, when they release free radicals in order to create a chemical kill zone, those free radicals in and of themselves can trigger off um, inflammation. And so all these things um, can be released by uh, different types of tissue, such as damaged tissue, the immune system cells, um, or they can be triggered off um, by blood uh, attempting to clot in the presence of bleeding. Okay, so of the three stages of inflammation, the first is mobilization of defenses. And the fastest way to get a whole bunch of white blood cells in an area and concentrate them in an area is to force blood to pool in a spot, um, cause, uh, which is called localized hyperemia. So what happens? Blood vessels in that spot vasodilate, um, and that vasodilation is triggered by histamine, uh, the leukotrienes, and various other cytokines can also play a role. And for the most part, this process of vasodilation is triggered off by the basophils and the mast cells and um, damaged tissue. Um, so with that hyperemia, um, there's a dilution in your uh, concentration of toxins, and concentration of metabolic waste, um, concentration of debris, uh, and all of those things are going to go up as the immune system cells fight against pathogens, because there's going to be a lot of metabolic waste as the immune system cells are going to be hyperactive, there's going to be lots of toxins as the pathogens are killed off, and lots of debris as well. The blood vessels at that area, not only do they dilate, but they also become more leaky or more permeable um, because they are leaky fluid, um, can move into tissue, and with that fluid, proteins can move into the tissue, and, and that's specifically your complement, your antibodies, your clotting factors, and white blood cells can also move into tissue. And that process of um, components moving out of the bloodstream into tissue is referred to as extravasation. Um, 
injured tissue can also um, trigger off inflammation by recruiting leukocytes. So not only can they secrete cytokines to directly trigger off inflammation, they can also secrete cytokines that will activate leukocytes or rather white blood cells around them. Um, and that will cause the white blood cells to then trigger off the process of inflammation in and of themselves. And the way that works is that um, when injured, cells create proteins called selectins and um, display the selectins on the cell membranes. That causes leukocytes to stick to the injured cells, uh, causing them to activate at a specific spot. So already by now, uh, we only discussed the first stage of inflammation out of the three stages, and we already have all the characteristics of inflammation, being redness, swelling, heat, and pain. We have redness because the blood is pooling in a specific area. Uh, that extravasation causes fluid to move out of the blood into the tissue, causing swelling. Um, that pooling of the blood um, and the uh, uh, entrapment of heat through because of the swelling causes heat uh, to accumulate in that area. Um, and then pain results either from the actual injured, cell, uh, injured cells themselves, or it can be because of pressure on the nerves from the swelling, or stimulation of the pain receptors uh, by inflammatory molecules, specifically the prostaglandins uh, and also bradykinin. Um, if you think about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and aspirin, they suppress prostaglandins, but the, uh, which reduces inflammation, but they also use as painkillers. And uh, this is part of the reason why they have painkilling activity because it prevent prostaglandins activating pain receptors. Another cause of pain might be toxins being released by the pathogens themselves. The second stage of inflammation is the containment and destruction of pathogens. So clotting factors move into this area of inflammation and they make clots and this, these clots make a sort of like gel-like um, matrix that almost acts like a spider's web and actually traps pathogens within itself. Neutrophils then rush into this area and um, they attack all these trapped pathogens and kill them. <coughs> and they are attracted to the area of inflammation through, the con uh, through chemotaxis. Basically, neutrophils react to cytokines and actually move towards wherever the cytokines are coming from, trying to find the, the trying to follow the chemical gradient, moving from a place where there's a low um, amount of cytokines to where there's a high amount of cytokines. They're basically attracted to these chemicals and um, they will follow the trail in order to find as many as possible. They also themselves secrete cytokines, uh, which recruits other neutrophils and recruits other macrophages to come into this area of inflammation. They also, uh, once the immune system cells are activated, one of the chemicals they release is colony stimulating factor, uh, which works on bone marrow um, to cause more white blood cells to be created, a process called leukopoiesis. And that's why um, if there's a strong enough inflammatory response, um, your um, white um, blood cells might uh, in the bloodstream might rise within a few hours due to the bone marrow pumping out more white blood cells. And if enough immune system cells die within this um, inflammatory area, the form of white fluid which is called pus, uh, a tiny amount can be resorbed, but if there's a large amount of pus then eventually it forms a, a cavity within the fla inflamed area and that area is called an abscess and generally once there's an abscess the only way to get rid of all that fluid um, is to drain the abscess and unfortunately until you've drained the abscess the inflammation will not uh, resolve. So remember uh, treatment for an abscess is to cut it open and let it drain um, not antibiotics. Antibiotics will not get rid of all that fluid. Um, the swelling of the, uh, in that area prevents uh, venous drainage and thus prevents veins from working properly. They get squished and um, that helps with the um, pooling of blood in the area. But what it also does is that um, all the excess fluid, because it cannot escape through the veins, it has to go through the lymph fluid. So it enters into the lymphatic system and that fluid is then filtered uh, through the lymph nodes and in the lymph nodes there are a lot of um, immune system cells and they will actually kill off pathogens entering into the lymph nodes. The last stage of inflammation is the cleanup and repair once the pathogens have been um, killed off. Monocytes migrate to inflammatory sites and become macrophages. Macrophages uh, eat up whatever bacteria are left behind, they eat up all the damaged cells, and they eat up all even dead immune system cells. And um, macrophages can also act as antigen-presenting cells to stimulate um, 
other types of immune reactions that we'll discuss in detail a bit later. Platelets in, uh, in that pool of blood uh, release platelet-derived growth factor um, that stimulates tissue growth. Um, the clots that were there to trap all the pathogens can now provide scaffolding for tissue to grow on, and that hyperemia helps to develop oxygen, helps to deliver oxygen and nutrients uh, for the process of tissue repair. Now we discuss quite a, a lot of key important concepts in immunity, and at this point we're going to shift away from um, discussing immune system cells and more into um, the immune system reactions and this is actually the difference between innate and acquired immunity. Um, the ability of a white blood cell to go around and attack something by itself um, is called innate immunity. It's a pre-programmed response to disease. It already exists. They're just genetically programmed that way. Um, but uh, lymphocytes in particular have ability to learn um, about new pathogens and to de um, develop new ways of fighting pathogens um, uh, after the first uh, infection, thereby giving you immunity. So it doesn't matter how much innate immunity you have, if you're infected by uh, Streptococcus pneumonia, that neutrophil then wipe it out the first time. If it comes a second time, the neutrophil has to do it again to wipe it out the second time. It's always exactly the same response. However, acquired immunity, um, after that first infection with Streptococcus, for example, um, the T cells and the B cells will develop special ways of fighting off that infection so that the next time you get that exactly same bacteria, um, instead of getting sick from it, uh, and then the neutrophil has to come in and destroy it, it's actually wiped out before it has an ability to establish itself. So um, that sort of immune system reaction is what can cause you to uh, have immunity. In other words, the ability to be exposed to a pathogen without getting ill. And, um, in that particular instance. And there are two major reactions, a cellular immunity um, and humoral immunity. Um, cellular immunity being a sort of cell versus cell response where T cells attack cells and humoral immunity being uh, antibody versus pathogen response whereby the B cells make antibodies. And we're going to go through these two um, acquired immunity reactions um, in detail over the next few slides. Okay, now, to, in order to understand the concept of the immune system reactions from so, with, uh, with cellular immunity and humoral immunity, we need to understand the concept of the antigen-presenting cell. Um, antigens are basically bits of pathogens that are able to bind to antibodies or to other white blood cells. Um, and certain cells in the immune system pr um, have the function of being antigen-presenting cells. Now, they get antigens and they show it off to other cells. And generally these are the macrophages or the B cells, other immune system cells can also do it. And even normal tissue uh, might at times um, have antigen presenting properties. But basically, um, looking at a macrophage or B cell, they'll phagocytose or absorb a little bit of pathogen, break it down in tiny little bits, and then display those tiny little bits of fragments on the cell membranes. And then the name for those fragments um, is epitopes, so we call them epitopes and they are displayed by a protein called major histocompatibility complex or otherwise called MHC. 
and this process of grabbing a bit of um, pathogen, um, taking a fragment and sticking it as an epitope on top of an MHC um, protein, uh, that whole process is referred to as antigen processing. And on occasion, um, antigen processing cells will accidentally display epitopes from normal tissue instead of um, pathogens, uh, but likely these are generally ignored, although they can be a trigger for autoimmune reactions. Now there are two types of major histocompatibility complex. Major histocompatibility complex 2, um, also known as human leukocyte antigen or HLA, is uh, the type that um, I've just described that's absorbed in a macrophage or B cell and immune system cells, um, where immune system cells display antigens they've come across. Um, the other type is MHC1, uh, major histocompatibility complex 1, which occurs on every cell in the body that has a nucleus. Um, so as long as there's a nucleus, there's going to have this uh, ability to um, have MHC1. Uh, for example, red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they obviously do not count. Um, um, but pretty much most of the tissue does have a nucleus, so most human tissue is able to present MHC1. And if that cell is infected with a virus or has become cancerous, it'll break uh, little bits of the cancer or the virus down, displays an epitope on the surface, and uh, that signals the immune system to come and activate, and also uh, is a self-destruct beacon um, to tell the immune system to come and destroy me before the virus or the cancer spreads. So that's MHC1. But for the rest of this discussion, we're basically going to be focusing on MHC2 um, in terms of the humoral immunity and cellular immunity. So we're going to start discussing um, the immune responses by focusing on cellular immunity, what I like to call the cell versus cell response, because uh, the end point of cellular immunity is that you have activated cells and they're destroying other cells. And it primarily involves your T lymphocytes, and um, it especially activates to destroy disease cells. In other words, normal tissue has become infected with a virus, or has become cancerous, or has become infected with intracellular parasite. Um, so this response is primarily directed to um, cleaning up disease cells, getting rid of disease cells, and as cell tissue that was normal has become diseased. Um, to a limited extent, it can also respond to bacterial invasion, for example, in extracellular problems um, by, uh, because the T helper cells can recruit neutrophils and macrophages to come and attack bacteria. But generally, cellular immunity is specially designed to destroy um, um, cells that are harboring disease and has to destroy cells of an intracellular problem. And um, the immune uh, system with cellular immunity with all these T cells, um, they, they do have an ability to sort of remember antigen markers that triggered off the cellular uh, immunity response and therefore in future um, uh, the response against those antigen markers that present will be much more aggressive and it can actually prevent further disease in the future contributing to immunity. Uh, but we'll discuss that in the memory phase of cellular immunity. <coughs> Um, there's a little the stuff in the italics over here is from a previous slide. Just a recap um, of the t uh, types of T lymphocytes. Um, there are many types of 
T lymphocytes, but we're going to focus on the four main types only. Um, it's the helper CD4 cells, um, which don't really do anything in and of themselves except stimulate other types of uh, cells. The cytotoxic cells that um, attach to disease cells and then um, damage them. Regulatory cells, um, which suppress T cells uh, and other T cells, preventing an excessive immune system response, and memory cells, which attack only um, a specific, um, which activate only in the presence of a specific antigen uh, to which they have been previously exposed. And cellular immunity has three phases: recognition phase. Um <coughs> which we're going to discuss under two stages, antigen presentation stage and activation stage. Then there's the attack phase and a memory phase. Okay, so before we can trigger off cellular immunity, we need to recognize what we are attacking. And this sort of recognition um, has two phases in and of itself, so two stages. Uh, first of all, we need an antigen to be presented by an antigen-presenting cell, and then we need a T cell to dock with the antigen-presenting cell to become activated. Um, so we're going to discuss each of these two steps uh, on a separate slide. So starting uh, off with antigen presentation, so in order for the recognition phase to kick in, we have to have something to recognize. So an antigen presenting cell, be it normal human tissue, or uh, that's been infected, or if it's a macrophage or neutrophil, can encounter an antigen, um, process it, and then display it as an epitope um, on top of a major histocompatibility complex of its cell membrane. If it's a macrophage or neutrophil, it will then migrate to a lymph node. Um, otherwise, um, if it's a normal, uh, if it's a disease cell, it has to wait uh, for a T cell to come across it. Uh, but generally, at some other point, this um, epitope is presented to a T cell, either a cytotoxic cell or a helper cell. Um, there are two types of major histocompatibility complex. Um, major histocompatibility complex 1 and 2. CD8 cells, or the cytotoxic cells, only respond to major histocompatibility complex 1. And um, these are only displayed by diseased um, human tissue. Um, and thus, the CD8 cells can then be triggered off to destroy those cells. CD8, CD4 um, T helper cells only respond to um, MHC2. And um, they activate CD8 cells, but they also recruit other immune system cells to destroy pathogens that exist outside of cells. <coughs> but basically, antigen-presenting cell binds with a T cell, and this activates the, the T cell involved, either the CD4 cell or the CD8 cell. Okay, now that uh, a T cell uh, 
has recognized that there's an epitope, it's going to undergo repeated mitosis and a clone of identical T cells is going to be created. So it's either a clone army of CD4 cells or a clone army of CD8 cells and some of these clones will become effector cells and will immediately start um, will immediately activate and carry out immune attacks or in the case of um, CD4 cells will start recruiting other cells while the rest become memory cells, they become dormant and will activate at a later stage if they come across that particular epitope uh, for a second time. Um, so the majority of them become, uh, will become memory cells and the result is that you then have this huge cloud of T cells roaming your bloodstream or sitting in your lymph nodes and they're programmed against one particular epitope and as soon as that epitope is um, encountered instead of um, um, instead of requiring that sort of whole phase of antigen presentation, uh, the T cells will immediately activate and immediately um, start working, which dramatically reduces um, the amount of work required to recognize a pathogen um, and will dramatically increase the speed uh, of destruction of a, of a pathogen or of a disease cell, meaning that you then develop uh, immunity towards um, um, that particular epitope or whatever carries that epitope um, uh, in other words the second time you're exposed to that epitope um, you're going to have a much stronger immune response, it's going to be much faster uh, and it's going to hopefully destroy the pathogen uh, before you even have a chance to get sick So let's talk about the, the attack phase. So a small percentage of those um, clone T cells will become um, effector cells and uh, they will immediately activate. Uh, your T helper cells will secrete interleukins and they will attract neutrophils and natural killer cells. They'll attract and stimulate macrophages. Um, they'll stimulate um, the mitosis and rapid matur maturation of both T cell, other T cells and, and B cells. This mostly happens in the lymph nodes um, because uh, the MHC2 compound is mostly on your roaming cells such as macrophages and they migrate to the lymph nodes and it's there that the CD4 T helper cells sort of concentrate and they activate there uh, and then release themselves into the rest of the body systems. But it can happen anywhere in the body. CD8 cells um, dock with disease cells and um, secrete perforins, granzymes, interferons, and tumor necrosis factor. mentioned those already in previous slides, so I won't go into detail again. Um, they can either directly dock immediately with a disease cell, or they might have to be activated by a CD4 cell um, to, to recognize that there is a disease cell in the area. So um, a lot of, s although CD8 cells can work by an in and of themselves to attack disease cells directly, uh, a significant amount of CD8 cells will only activate in the presence of an activated um, T helper cell. So it might be the macrophage gets an epitope, goes to the lymph node, stimulates T helper cells, T helper cells and uh, go out mitosis. Some of them will then become effector cells, go into the bloodstream, find the CD8 cells and activate them um, and only then will the CD8 cells will then try and find these disease cells and destroy them. So you can uh, imagine that not having CD4 cells is actually going to greatly reduce the effectiveness of your CD8 cells because much of their response does require CD4 T helper cells to come and say hello and activate them. And with HIV, uh, which destroys your CD4 cells, um, there's a particular problem because even though the rest of your immune system is, ta is intact, you still have your CD8 cells. Uh, without the CD4 cells to stimulate them, um, the effectiveness of your CD8 cells greatly drops and it's almost as if you've knocked out your CD8 cells as well, even though HIV only destroys CD4 cells.
Anyway, this response we also refer to as the primary immune response if it's the first time that you expose that specific um, epitope. Um, this phase will peak in about a week um, and then gradually declines and it's uh, often called the primary and it's called the primary immune response. Um, note that it takes about a week to peak. Um, so if you've been infected with a virus and there's viruses in your throat, for example, um, it's going to take about a week for your CD8 cells and your CD4 cells to really be at their peak effic efficacy and wipe out those viral infected cells, which explains why it can take um, about a week uh, to recover, um, to start feeling better or start recovering from a viral infection like a cold or a flu. Many viral infections actually last about a week and this is the reason because it takes that long for the response to peak. After that week, uh, after that peak, uh, the viruses are usually under control or whatever pathogen is usually under control and then the response will gradually decline and after that the memory cells will take over in what's called the secondary immune response which we'll discuss on the next slide. Right, so as mentioned, some of the T-cell clones become memory T-cells. They live for a long time. There are much more of them um, than unactivated T-cells. They activate much more easily and much more aggressively when exposed to the old epitope that um, created them, as it were. And this um, easy and aggressive response is referred to as a T-cell recall response. It's also called secondary immune response or secondary immunity and often this will destroy pathogens before they can properly establish themselves uh, before they can properly establish themselves hopefully preventing the disease in the first place and as um, giving a bit of immunity to a disease okay so having discussed uh, cellular immunity let's go to humoral immunity uh, which is a process whereby the immune system creates antibodies or immunoglobulins which we have discussed earlier and these antibodies then attack cells or um, attack um, allergens or other things that are dis, um, sort of interpreted as pathogenic um, uh, by the human body. I like to remember it as being antibody versus um, pathogen as opposed to cellular immunity which often is in sort of involves a cell versus cell response. So it's, a, uh, it's considered to be an indirect method of attacking um, pathogens in the sense that um, 
unlike with other forms of uh, immunity like innate immunity or cellular immunity you don't have a cell attacking the pathogen directly rather um, the cell is activated as a B lymphocyte the B lymphocyte then secretes um, antibodies in that drift in the bloodstream and they may or may not end up um, at, at latching on to the pathogen um, it's a bit of an indirect way of uh, dealing with um, pathogens and it's divided into more or less the same phases of cellular immunity we need to recognize the pathogen we need to attack the pathogen and then we need to prevent the pathogen from coming back again uh, through the memory phase Before we go into the nitty gritty of the humoral immune response, I need you to understand what is an antibody, how does it work, etc. We've briefly touched on it on a previous slide, but let's go into a bit more detail. Antibodies or immunoglobulins are made by the B cells as mentioned, and they have two regions. They have a variable V region um, and a constant C region. Um, the C region determines what type of antibody it is, and the V region will determine exactly what antigen, uh, which is the part of a pathogen that the antibody can attach to, the V region determines what that antibody will attach to. So there are five types of C regions, and those are five classes of antibody. Immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin D, immunoglobulin E, immunoglobulin G otherwise IgA, IgM, IgD, IgD, IgG. And the human immune system can create about one trillion different antibody types and others is trillions of V regions. So although we have five classes, and those five types of C regions, we can have up to, up to one trillion different V regions. Now, up to our human body can attack up to one trillion different types of pathogens using humoral immunity. Um, now, the thing about the human body is that pretty much everything has to be made by DNA. So, if, um, if we had to do it old school, we would need one trillion different types of DNA to make one trillion uh, types of view regions. But the body, um, instead of having a trillion different types of DNA for trillion pathogen types, instead has uh, ways and means whereby it can artificially generate new DNA in order to make these new view regions. And there's two methods involved, it's called somatic recombination and somatic hypermutation. And both these processes will make new DNA, which means that we can make new types of um, proteins and those new types of V regions. So we don't have to have um, um, DNA hard-coded hard into our genetic structure to make um, all these trillion types of antibodies. We can make it on the fly. Somatic recombination is a process whereby B cells uh, shuffle up their own DNA and by shuffling their own DNA they create new types of DNA and they're therefore able to produce new types of proteins and therefore new types of uh, V regions. Uh, with somatic hypermutation is when B cells, um, immature B cells and germinal centers that are um, gr uh, mut um, dividing and growing up, um, with every division there's very high rates of mutation. In other words, B cells, when they're undergoing mitosis, do not have um, uh, do not have 100% accuracy rate. There's a lot of mutation in that mitotic process, and therefore, um, because of mutation, there's brand new DNA sequences being made all the time, and that also contributes to uh, creating a wide variety of V regions that the B cells can create. <coughs> 
this is um, a previous slide in the lecture. I just thought it would be good to put it here as a recap. It's basically saying that we've got five types of amino globulins and uh, in terms of general principles they work by active um, by either binding to an active site and therefore neutralizing um, the pathogen which is neutralization they can um, help um, b um, by binding of complement um, in other words uh, through the process of complement fixation they can glue cells together through agglutination and they can glue molecules together through precipitation and an IgD and IgE can also um, also have a regulatory function uh, on certain immune system cells okay I want to go into more detail on those C regions uh, so V regions um, merely um, decide which pathogen or antigen the immunoglobulin is going to stick to. However, what the immunoglobulin does when it's stuck to the um, pathogen is determined by the C region. So let's discuss each of the uh, five types of C region. Starting with immunoglobulin N, um, this is the first type of antibody that is usually made in response to a detected um, pathogen. So if you do blood tests uh, for a specific virus in the early stages of the infection, you will find that the IgM levels will be very high and the IgG levels will probably uh, um, be almost near zero. Um, and then later on in the disease, IgM levels will start to drop and the IgG levels will increase. IgM is a very large molecule. It has 10 binding sites, so it binds very easily and very aggressively to pathogens, and also it's extremely efficient agglutination. So it's really going to stick uh, pathogens together and uh, to other cells of the body, preventing them from properly functioning and trapping them in um, so that macrophages can come and eat them. Unfortunately, um, it can make very large structures uh, through this agglutination that we call immune complexes, and these can become a focus for inflammation um, and is uh, very much responsible for those body pains that you can get, for example, for flu infection. Um, so we can't have too much IgM for too long, otherwise we're going to have way too much inflammation uh, to the point where it's going to uh, damage um, the human body and therefore IgM production is slowed down as soon as possible. So although it's very powerful and very potent, um, we cannot rely on it for our immunity. What we do rely on for long-term immunity is immunoglobulin G, which is a small molecule, uh, very easy to produce um, uh, by the B cells, doesn't require a lot of um, protein and ATP to make, etc. And the nice thing about IgG is because it's so small, it's also able to penetrate um, outside of the bloodstream. So IgM is kind of stuck in the bloodstream. It's not really able to cross the, um, the vascular walls very easily. IgG can very easily cross over. It can even cross over the placenta, so it can provide a fetal immunity um, uh, for pregnant women. Um, and it's responsible for long-term immunity. It takes a few days for IgG levels to rise after a pathogen, but on the other hand, it can stay high for a long time. It can stay high for m uh, months or even years, uh, unlike IgM, which will start uh, falling down um, after about a week. Because immunoglobulin G can stay uh, raised for e years, it can... Um, it means that um, as soon as you're infected with that pathogen again, the immunoglobulin G will immediately attack it before there's a chance to even cause disease, uh, tagging it for destruction or uh, otherwise neutralizing it. And therefore, you'll, um, even though you're infected with that same virus or same disease, uh, you won't even feel sick the second time around you're infected because it's wi the disease is wiped out before it has a chance to establish itself. And this is basically how vaccination works. Va vaccination in general works by stimulating immunoglobulin G uh, for several years so that uh, you are then immune to um, that disease. Immunoglobulin A uh, is unique in the sense that it's resistant to digestion and uh, breaking down. Um, and because it's so resistant to breaking down, it is present uh, very much in body fluids that have digestive enzymes or other um, enzymes that stimulate uh, breaking down or otherwise hostile places uh, to be in. So they're present in the digestive juices and urine on any mucosal surface. They're even present in sweat and tears, um, basically places that are hostile to pretty much everything else, but where we can still have 
very hardy pathogens or very uh, tough bacteria and viruses trying to invade our bodies through these um, places. So immunoglobulin A mainly works by stubbornly um, latching onto pathogens um, uh, so th um, and then Remember, the pathogens, if they're on the mucosal surface or if they're on our skin or climbing up our urethras to invade our bladders, um, in order to invade the body, they have to cross over that uh, mucosal surfaces or the skin surface, and IgA latches onto them and actually prevents them from invading the mucosal surface or bladder surface or the gastrointestinal surface. Um, uh, it sticks onto them stubbornly and prevents them from crossing over into uh, body's tissue. IgE um, mainly uh, stimulates mast cells, although it does have other functions. Um, but um, its main role is uh, its main lone main known role is to stimulate mast cells, and as it's mainly immunoregulatory uh, immunoglobulin, and it plays a major role in starting allergic reactions and also starting the inflammatory process. Immunoglobulin D um, is a somewhat mysterious immunoglobulin. Uh, its exact functions are still not fully understood. It primarily appears to only be a immunoregulator uh, uh, with the knowledge that we have at this time and it uh, can change the activity of many other immune system cells and like immunoglobulin A it's also present in some secretions.
So let's get some clinical insights based on the knowledge we have thus far. <coughs> One of the symptoms of uh, influenza is bodily pains, especially in the back, and also joint pains. And why is that? Well, it's because the IgM molecule is uh, secreted uh, whenever the flu virus invades the body and there's a massive amount of IgM and these large molecules then bind to flu viruses and each other and they create large crystals of immune complexes and these large sort of molecules, these large complexes drift in the blood and muscles happen to have a really good blood supply so they'll often end up in the muscles and they end up being trapped in the muscles um, the immune complexes then trigger off inflammation around them and because there's so many of them in the muscles you're going to end up having inflammation in the muscles and what is one of the four characteristics of inflammation? It's pain. Therefore you're going to have pain in the muscle and that's why uh, influenza can often make you feel as if you've been hit by a bus and everything in your body hurts it's because of all those immune complexes triggering off inflammation all over the body and it takes a while for those IgM levels to start dropping and you'll only really have relief from those body pains once the IgM levels start to drop. Also of note, um, if you're doing blood tests to check for the different immunoglobulins, if you see a patient with a raised immunoglobulin E, that um, will generally suggest an allergic reaction or an allergy to something specific. You can even test for immunoglobulin E specific to different types of allergens like dust or pollen um, and if you are trying to figure out what the patient is allergic to. Okay, so we've discussed antibodies in detail. Let's now go into the process of how antibodies are made for the process of humoral immunity. So as stated before, it has three phases. We start with the recognition phase. Now, a B cell, after it has gone through somatic hypermutation or somatic recombination, will be programmed to create a specific type of V region. Um, it then displays receptors for that V region on its uh, cell surface and generally it only has that one type of V region it has programmed itself to make and it basically spends its uh, life roaming the body hoping that an antigen will bind to its receptor. Um, if an uh, antigen uh, binds to the receptor it's absorbed by the B cell. The B cell does this through um, a process called endocytosis which is basically phagocytosis on a smaller scale. <coughs> At this point some B cells will immediately become active and uh, these B cells only secrete IgM. Um, they don't need T cells to do this, so this is a T cell independent activation. Other B cells do break down the antigen and display it as epitopes on their surface membrane using MHC2 proteins. You remember that CD4 um, helper cells bind to these ones, and in fact that's what happens. The CD4 T helper cell docks with the B cell and activates them uh, by secreting lots of interleukins and the interleukins activate the B cell. That causes the B cell to multiply through the process of mitosis and then we have an army of clones made by the B cell. Most clones um, become plasma cells and most of them will then roam around the body uh, throughout their lives uh, pumping antibodies into the bloodstream. However, some will become memory B cells which we we'll touch on in the memory phase. And uh, this process tends to happen in lymph nodes. Um, and the plasma cells thus formed, about 10% of them will stay in the lymph nodes, uh, therefore pumping antibodies into the lymph fluid, while the rest migrate to various parts of the body. Some of them roam around, a lot of them sort of lodge in a specific place, especially the spleen, and just sit there and pump out antibodies uh, for the rest of their lifespans. <coughs> 
So after this army of clones is created, I said um, some of them become will become plasma cells, and that leads into the next phase of the humoral immunity response called the attack phase, also referred to as the primary immune response of humoral immunity. The attack phase, um, unfortunately, only starts about three to six days after the antigen becomes present. So if it's the first time you've been inflict infected with a specific virus, for example, you're only really going to start developing a strong immune response to that about three to six days later. Uh, that's because all those um, B cells need time to multiply through mitosis and mature. First antibodies to be produced will be the IgM molecules that peaks in about 10 days after that IgM declines um, and as the IgM declines the IgG rises. Um, IgG response will last for about a month and um, in the acute sort of primary um, immune response the first time you're infected uh, with something that IgG uh, elevation will start to b uh, drop in about a month's time. Okay, so some B cell uh, clones become memory cells, as are plasma cells, and they mainly sit and stay in the lymph nodes, and they don't activate immediately. They wait for re-exposure to the original antigen, and if they detect that original antigen in the lymph fluid, they very rapidly respond, they, and they churn out immunoglobulin G within a few hours of being exposed to that antigen. So Unlike the primary response, which can take three to six days, because you need that amount of time for those clones to mature, now we've got a response that happens within a few hours and peaks within a few days, and can even remain elevated for weeks to years, giving continuous protection against whatever is the source of that antigen. And often no illness will result because a pathogen uh, will be wiped out uh, before it has a proper chance to establish itself and cause illness. And this is, cause, uh, this is a secondary immune response uh, of humoral uh, immunity. So we've discussed normal immune responses, let's now discuss what happens when things go wrong with your immune responses. What happens when immune responses, instead of um, helping to, to prevent disease uh, or treat disease, actually cause disease? Well, the most common type of immune system dysfunction is the allergy, whereby immunoglobulin E binds with a normal environmental molecule and it stimulates mast cells to release histamine and causes inflammation uh, in a very severe form. Uh, we, uh, we call it anaphylaxis and that can actually be a life-threatening um, uh, allergic situation. Another type of allergy is hypersensitivity. Um, it's a type of allergic reaction but involves mainly IgG, IgM or T cells and the uh, interesting thing about hypersensitivity reactions is that they can actually take um, several hours or several days um, to actually cause the reaction after exposure to the um, whatever triggered off the hypersensitivity. So, whereas allergies tend to happen immediately, so for example, if you're allergic to dust or, or cats or whatever, uh, if you're allergic to cats and you walk into a room with cats, then immediately starts with hypersensitivity, um, it might actually cause an allergic reaction uh, several days later. So, it might be more difficult to figure out exactly wha what the uh, what the thing you're allergic to is. Autoimmunity is um, 
when uh, your own tissue is interpreted as being pathogenic so the, normal, the immune system then starts attacking normal tissue and causing destruction of normal tissue and that is uh, the case in the diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis where the immune system destroys your own joints or systemic lupus erythematosus where it can destroy connective tissue and various other autoimmune disorders. Alloimmunity is when um, the normal immune response is unwanted so it's normal for the immune response to look for foreign tissue and decide that this foreign tissue is undesirable we must destroy it unfortunately if you're doing a kidney transplant or liver transplant or whatever transplant that's actually not something that you desire um, you don't want that immune response so unfortunately with organ transplants um, often uh, the patients have to go through immunosuppressive therapy to reduce the activity of the immune systems just to give their organs a chance to survive Immunodeficiency is a disease where you have no immune response or you don't have a very good immune response and there are various types um, and it can be born of it, it can be genetic, the most severe example being sustained commun uh, combined immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, people with sustained combined immunodeficiency syndrome become very easily uh, sick and very quickly and um, uh, if they're diagnosed early on they might um, they might be uh, advised to live in a sort of bubble type of thing so um, uh, there was a famous case in the 70s of a boy that was called Bubble Boy who had to live his whole life basically in a, a sterile uh, plastic box in a hospital uh, because the moment he stepped outside uh, he would fall Ill, dramatically ill he eventually died at about the age of 12 when he did accidentally step outside and he got he got a cold and from the, uh, from the cold he actually started getting cancer because um, the virus just wreaked havoc on his body he had no immune system to to stop it Immunodeficiency can also be acquired. You can get it through using steroids uh, or other immunosuppressive drugs. Um, infections can cause uh, uh, a loss of immune responses. For example, if you have TB or cytomegalovirus infection of the bone marrow, uh, you won't be able to make white blood cells, therefore you can become immune deficient. But by far the most famous example in South Africa is, um, is what's called acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS caused by the HIV virus. Um, it um, generally wipes out your CD4 cells and by wiping out the CD4 cells it pretty much incapacitates both your um, cytotoxic uh, or your cellular immunity and your humoral immunity. You remember that uh, CD4 cells are also required to activate B cells so that's um, an example of immu acquired immunodeficiency.
So we've discussed immune reactions and we've briefly touched on um, um, dysfunctions of the immune system. Now I want to talk about um, how the immune system can be influenced by our emotional state. Or specifically, uh, we're going to look uh, for the moment how is immunity affected by stress. Now, physiologically, um, stress is defined as any state where there's an increased amount of cortisol in the bloodstream. And the state can, has to be caused by a stressor, which can be physical, such as trauma, being shot by a gun, or being deprived by oxygen, um, or have even having an infection can be a stressor. And uh, stressors can also be emotional, like anger, hatred, uh, depression. And um, this stress, uh, this increased cortisol level in humans is often also accompanied by a rise in adrenaline levels. And we're going to look um, at how does cortisol affect immunity and how does adrenaline affect immunity. And then uh, we'll come to some uh, important conclusions regarding the relationship between immunity and stress. This is uh, what's called the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Uh, basically, I just want to give you a brief uh, run through of all the steps uh, from having a stressor to having that increased level of cortisol. Um, but basically, when the brain experiences uh, that it's, uh, there's a stress state going on, um, the hypothalamus will secrete corticotropin releasing hormone, often abbreviated as CRH. That corticotropin releasing hormone then goes to the anterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland uh, secretes adrenocorticotropic hormone into the bloodstream. It then diffuses through the bloodstream to the adrenal gland, which sits on top of our kidneys, and the adrenal gland will then secrete cortisol. Um, and that's how stress causes that increased elevation of cortisol. Now, cortisol is an immunosuppressive um, hormone. It's good that it's immunosuppressive because it plays a major role in preventing our immune system from overreacting. When there's a lot of inflammation, cortisol will come in, tone down that inflammation, preventing it from uh, wreaking havoc. Um, however, in term, uh, if there's a lot of stress and there's not much uh, inflammation going on, it can cause problems. But let's have a look at exactly what cortisol does. First of all, cortisol, um, how it works is that it diffuses into uh, cells and diffuses into cell nuclei and then it alters uh, both how cellular mechanisms work in the cell and also uh, influences how DNA is expressed in the cell. And what can uh, and the effects that it can uh, induce in cells are it can kill immature T and B cells. So T helper cells and um, CD8 cells and B cells that haven't had a chance to mature will die off and because uh, they'll die off there's less of an ability to uh, create those initial phases of humoral and cellular response. Um, cortisol suppresses your B, uh, B cells so they make less um, antibodies um, and obviously um, if you're killing off T cells you're going to have reduced number of lymphocytes in general. Um, the just uh, as cortisol can suppress activity of B cells to make less antibodies, it can also suppress the activity of T cells. Uh, so even if you have the same number of T cells, they won't be as active as before. And it can suppress all the other leukocytes as well. Um, because it's suppressing all the leukocytes, it's obviously going to reduce the amount of cytokines made by them. And it can also decrease uh, prostaglandin production, therefore reading, uh, leading to reduced inflammation. Now sometimes these are good effects because uh, sometimes you might have too much inflammation and you need to calm it down. Um, unfortunately, if um, uh, if this uh, cortisol is allowed to go on for a long time, 
uh, eventually you're going to end up having consequences from all this immunosuppression. Uh, for example, you're going to have less CD8 cells, which means there's going to be less fighting against cancer cells. People under chronic stress are more likely to get cancer. Uh, your immune system in general is not working well, so people under chronic stress get more infections. Um, and this, um, as part of that, uh, um, higher background rate of infection, you're going to have much more of an infection of the stomach, um, particularly by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, and Helicobacter Bacter pylori causes stomach ulcers, uh, and also duodenal ulcers. Um, so stress um, can actually cause problems with the stomach and duodenum by triggering off peptic ulcers. Chronic stress, because of the uh, suppression of immunity by this cortisol, is going to cause your lymphatic tissue to, um, to atrophy. So you're going to have smaller lymph nodes, less lymph tissue, um, simply because they've got nothing to do. They're not making T cells, they're not maturing B cells, um, they have fewer cells in them, they have less of a job to do, so then they atrophy. So overall, those are the consequences of cortisol on immunity. So we've talked about the step-by-step -step process of cortisol secretion. Let's talk now about the step-by-step -step process of making adrenaline, which is through the system called the sympathetic medullary axis. So we have our stressor again, and the brain interprets it as stress, and signals are sent to the thoracolumbar region of the spine, where there are various ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system um, alongside um, the spine, and they are stimulated. Um, um, when those ganglions are stimulated, the axons go uh, to the adrenal medulla via the celiac uh, ganglia. And uh, they send when they fire off signals in the adrenal medulla, it's the adrenal medulla is stimulated to secrete adrenaline and noradrenaline. They dump the adrenaline, noradrenaline in the to the into the bloodstream, and therefore we have the effects of adrenaline. So what does adrenaline do to immunity? Well, unlike cortisol, adrenaline actually boosts your immunity. So it's a bit of a balancing act between the cortisol and adrenaline. Adrenaline stimulates the activity of most white blood cells, causing them to move more, to migrate more, and to secrete more cytokines. So whereas cortisol tends to um, kill off a lot of um, white blood cells, adrenaline will stimulate the activity of the remaining white blood cells. Therefore, adrenaline promotes immune system activity and is a prom uh, promoter of inflammation. It also diverts uh, blood flow from less essential organs, diverts blood flow uh, to the brain and the heart, 
for example, and to sc um, skeletal muscle and away from the gastrointestinal system. This is a problem because, um, especially in terms of the stomach, the stomach needs a constant supply of immune system cells in order to fight off Helicobacter pylori. The stomach is always um, burning itself up with hydrochloric acids. So it constantly needs a co supply of nutrition in order to rebuild itself. If you cut off the blood supply to the stomach, you literally reduce the supply of immune system cells and the supply of nutrition. And this is another contributing factor for why stress causes peptic ulcers because there's less immunity and less and nutrient supply um, to the stomach wall and to the gastrointestinal wall for the repairing of ulcers. Okay, so in acute situations, stress is probably good for the immune, immune system. All that adrenaline activates your immune system cells, and then the cortisol prevents the immune system cells from going into hyperdrives, and not as it prevents um, over excesses of inflammation. However, in the long term, we enter a sort of disease state where we enter a immunosuppressed pro-inflammatory state. So what happens is that you have fewer white blood cells because cortisol keeps killing off the immature white blood cells. And then, because you have fewer white blood cells, you end up getting more infections. Be, um, um, you end up having less defenses towards viral and bacterial invasion, and you end up getting sick more often because you have fewer white blood cells. Although they are more active because of the adrenaline, they, um, they're so few in number that they cannot cope with the ex um, extra uh, workload. There are also more, the immune system cells are also more active because of the adrenaline. And so with this combination of adrenaline plus a greater background infec uh, infection rate, um, your immune system cells are going to be um, pumping out pro-inflammatory cytokines. And infected tissue in and of itself is also going to pump out pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. So you're going to end up having a pro-inflammatory um, state, but even though you're immune suppressed because you have fewer white blood cells. And situations that can, where this can occur can be psychological situations such as um, divorce and marital conflict. Um, poverty has also been uh, uh, shown to have an immunosuppressive pro-inflammatory uh, effect on people. Um, and even some abstract things like loneliness, uh, if it's there long enough, can cause you to enter a pro-inflammatory immunosuppressed state. And we know that uh, these sort of situations can lead uh, to predispositions or a, uh, worsenings of chronic medical conditions, uh, especially inflammatory medical conditions such as asthma and arthritis um, and heart disease, but also things like diabetes. And uh, with long enough stress and severe enough stress, you enter the classic stress triad. Um, which is where you get peptic ulcers, um, you have atrophy of your lymphatic tissue because um, of your immunosuppression, and you have adrenal hypertrophy because it's constantly pumping out adrenaline and cortisol, so that adrenal tissue uh, starts swelling up. Note that um, s chronic stress doesn't necessarily need to be just psychological, it can also be physical, such as being um, admitted into ICU or having um, a cancerous tumor that won't go away, um, or having um, chronic infection like TB can also be interpreted by the body as, um, as chronic stress and can lead to this um, pro-inflammatory immunosuppressive um, conditioning of the immune system.
Well, we've talked about the effects of stress on immunity and um, even stress as a psychological uh, input can uh, affect immunity. Um, but on the other hand, there's also pretty good evidence that the opposite of um, psychological stress, which could arguably be happiness, has an effect on immunity. Um, there is a bit of a problem in the sense that we don't have a very good definition for what is happiness. Um, uh, psychological stress and physiology is very easy um, to define. We just say anything that causes you to have an increased level in cortisol, well, that's stress. Um, Whereas happiness, well, we haven't quite figured out what it does um, in terms of um, a nice physiological definition. But there's some clear um, effects that happiness has on immunity, and we're going to briefly go uh, through what research has been done. So um, we've talked about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which causes uh, the increased um, se uh, secretion of cortisol. Um, happy people appear to have a suppressed hypothalamic pituitary adrenal uh, axis. If you're generally a happy person and you're under stress, you are not going to secrete as much cortisol as a generally depressed person. Um, happy people do not have as a powerful a stress um, cortisol response um, to troubles that occur in their life, whether it be physical or psychological, as uh, unhappy people. Happy people also have more active immune systems. Um, they have higher levels of antibodies, higher levels of CD4 T helper cells. Um, the natural killer cells are more active as well. And in uh, response to uh, infections or vaccinations, they have a greater immune response. Um, clinical relevance of that is that if you have a depressed person and you give them a vaccination, there's a higher chance of failure than giving a vaccine to a happy person because a vaccine requires an immune response. If you give a vaccine to a depressed person, they might not have as a uh, big immune response. The vaccine might fail. Whereas happy people have a stronger immune response, um, and they're more likely to be successfully vaccinated. Um, happy people also have a higher release of endogenous opiates. Um, opiates are your body's natural painkillers. Um, in other words, um, happy people have better release of painkillers, of natural painkillers in their nervous system and in their brains and that translates to having an increased pain threshold. In other words, happy people are able to tolerate a heck of a lot more pain than unhappy people. And um, happy people are generally ra uh, uh, ra rated as being more attractive, so psychological studies have shown that we are more attracted to happy people than unhappy people, so happy people tend to have uh, more friends simply because they're more attractive as personalities and with that better support network they get less psychological stress and have less physiological stress leading to less of that cortisol uh, and uh, less risk of developing that chronic stress syndrome of um, a pro-inflammatory immunosuppressive state. So um, being happy has um, a lot of benefits for your immune system. On a related note to happiness, let's quickly talk about relaxation and how relaxation can affect the uh, immune system. Uh, when you're relaxed, you have um, ex uh, extra activity through the parasympathetic nervous system, especially through, uh, through the vagus nerve, which is um, sort of the main stimulus of parasympathetic activity in the human body. And 
uh, vagal nerve activity, when that, uh, when that va vagus nerve is very active, there appears to be a strong anti-inflammatory effect exerted by it, and that anti-inflammatory effect can uh, be measured in conditions um, as diverse as uh, shock, sepsis, um, um, heart attacks and strokes, arthritis, and even uh, pancreatitis. Which is which is strange because literally that means that if you're a relaxed person with a heart attack, for example, with cardiac ischemia, that means that you're going to have a better outcome than a stressed person who's having the heart attack. So you might be exactly the same patient, exactly the same weight. Uh, it could be your genetic twin, for all I know. But if your genetic twin is stressed out and you yourself are happy and relaxed and you both have a heart attack at the same time, the relaxed person is going to have better outcomes and less damage to the heart than the stressed out person. Simply because the um, by being relaxed, you're going to have an anti-inflammatory effect, you're going to have less inflammation in your heart, you're going to have less damage to your heart from the ischemia. And how does that work? Well, the vagus nerve neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter pretty much of the whole parasympathetic nervous system, and um, not only is that acetylcholine used as a neurotransmitter, but when the nerves are actively secreting acetylcholine to communicate with one another, some of the acetylcholine is going to leak away from the synapse and is going to leak into the bloodstream. So when your parasympathetic nervous system is active, not only are the nerves going to be secreting acetylcholine, but your blood acetylcholine levels are also going to rise. And they're going to have certain effects. They're going to bind with macrophages and they're going to bind with other immune system cells. And it's sort of the opposite effect of adrenaline. Adrenaline stimulates immune system cells and encourages cytokine formation. Acetylcholine does the opposite. It um, suppresses the activity and suppresses the cytokine formation, therefore having an anti-inflammatory effect by suppressing the activity. And that seems to explain why relaxation exercises and meditation and phys uh, moderate physical exercise and things like yoga can have an anti-inflammatory effect and can actually improve things like arthritis and chronic disease, uh, simply because by relaxing the person, um, you stimulate the blood increase of uh, acetylcholine, suppressing um, uh, those pro-inflammatory cells and therefore um, reducing the effects of inflammation through the body. At this point, I want to touch on a very important concept. Uh, Alright, so 
the brain creates opioids, and opioids are your natural painkillers made by the by the body, and also uh, helps um, induce feelings of well-being. So, you know, not only do you, are you pain-free, but you also feel happier. And one of the sort of clues that pointed out that the opioids are responsible for the placebo effect was the fact that you can pretty much cancel out placebo effects by giving a medication called naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist. So if a person really believes that homeopathic medications um, um, will cure him of his diseases, and you give him a b and say, that's fine, take this um, homeopathic medication and take this naloxone as well, suddenly the person will find that the homeopathic medication is no longer works as well as it used to. Not only that, but you can actually pump up placebo effects or enhance placebo effects by giving a medication that enhan enhances opioid activity. An example here is proglumide. Uh, so if you give proglumide to someone who believes homeopathic medication will cure him, um, then the, the, the medication will actually become even greater. So how does this ha how does this work? How is, how is it that by taking a homeopathic medication, some people will um, be able to cure themselves of colds and flus, or e um, in some extreme cases, some people have even been able to cure themselves of cancer uh, by taking medications that should have absolutely no cancer effect whatsoever. Well, it's because uh, of that placebo effect. They they think it's going to help, and uh, because they think it's going to help, um, the brain will produce opioids, and that reduces pain. Uh, and helps with feelings of well-being, that reduces psychological stress, that reduces cortisol, and then there's less immune suppression, and then the immune system suddenly is more active because of the suppression of um, cortisol secretion. And therefore, it can then fight off the disease much more easily. And um, in terms of pro-inflammatory conditions such as asthma, um, the placebo effect might be even strong enough to help with asthma. And in some rare cases, the placebo effect is even strong enough. There's enough of an immune boosting effect that the immune system is finally able to fight off a cancer. Um, and so sometimes, in, in rare cases, you do get people who take vitamins or homeopathic medication and they're cured of cancers because their um, the belief in the medication is so powerful that uh, the opioids are secreted and then uh, the immune system is stimulated. The opposite of the placebo effect is the nocebo effect, uh, which appears to involve a neurotransmitter called cholecystokinin, uh, which is also involved in gallbladder physiology, but we won't touch on that here. But uh, it's also there's you could also find cholecystokinin in the brain, and there it has a function of being an antagonist of opioids. So it cancels out the pain-killing effect, cancels out the uh, well-being effect. Not only that, but there's also a uh, decreased secretion of opioids and a decreased secretion of dopamine, which is the uh, neurotransmitter necessary to be happy. Um, and thus, if a person feels that they have um, received an incorrect treatment or they, they're getting ill, um, they're going to have this cascade where they're going to have cholecystokinin blocking off the opioids, they're going to have less dopamine and less opioids, and with that they're going to have more stress, and then their cortisol levels are going to rise. And, if, and because the cortisol levels have rise, they're going to enter into that immunosuppressive state, and that um, can worsen diseases they have, or can even 
um, cause disease in and of itself. Uh, so if a person is constantly worried that they're go uh, going to fall ill with something, that constant worry can actually cause them to actually fall ill physically. Uh, in the same way, um, if a person has cancer and they've lost all hope and they're convinced this cancer is going to kill them, then yes, that cancer is going to become much more virulent because um, by losing all that hope and by putting themselves in that stressful mindset, uh, they enter that immunosuppressed pro-inflammatory state. Okay, so what is the clinical significance then of placebo and placebo effect for you guys as future doctors? Um, well, studies have shown that even abstract things can have placebo and placebo effects, things like the color of pills, or the brand name of the medication, how doctors um, have an attitude, the bedside manner, even how they're dressed, how clean the hospital is, that sort of thing. And even being told a diagnosis, even if it's the wrong diagnosis, seems to exert a placebo effect. So um, just telling the patient what's wrong with them can exert a placebo effect and it can actually, uh, might even cure them, even if you've given them the wrong treatment. Um, other things to touch on, like for example, blue colored pills uh, are more calming than uh, red colored pills, even if it's the same molecule. Um, some patients will not, uh, cannot get well on a generic, they prefer the brand name medication and actually does work better for them because of placebo effect. And um, some doctors, w uh, some patients will come to you as a doctor uh, not because you're particularly smart or intelligent, but simply because they like your manner, they like the way you treat them, and just visiting you makes them feel better. Um, and that can, just having having a good bedside manner can give you an edge over um, other doctors who might um, know their knowledge better, but uh, they don't treat the patients very well. And the thing is, the placebo effect can increase the effect of your medication. So if you give them an antibiotic, but you also, because of your pleasant bedside manner, have sort of exerted a bit of a placebo effect on them, the antibiotic will be stronger. Whereas if you give the correct treatment, but for whatever reason you've exerted an placebo effect on the patient, um, it will reduce the efficacy of um, the medication. So, you know, just by being pleasant and well-dressed, um, you can end up curing patients even while you give the incorrect treatment. And that's why many people feel better after seeing a homeopath or an acupuncturist or whatever quack uh, doctor they can find. Um, because just that sort of experience of having someone listen to your problems and give a diagnosis and give a uh, and be pleasant and give you a treatment plan, just that experience is enough to cure some people. Um, Whereas going to a doctor with an unpleasant attitude um, and a poor bedside manner um, can actually make people worse and s might be that they do not get better even when they're given uh, the correct treatment, which is arguably why patients, um, why more and more patients are refusing to see doctors and would rather go see a homeopath. Uh, the most common complaint I hear in my GP practice is that doctors these days do not even bother uh, listening to their patients or giving them time to lis uh, listen um, uh, so that they can tell their story. Um, and that is part of the sort of placebo effect of a consultation. Just having someone listen uh, to your story without interrupting you can exert a placebo effect. And doctors these days are in such a rush to see patients, they're not even giving that to their patients. But a take-home message uh, for this slide is that um, a good doctor should be able to exert a placebo effect by his mere presence, by his attitude, by his dress, by his bedside manner. Um, at the very some, you'll not be able to cure every single disease uh, that you come across, either because you don't know enough about disease or because the disease is incurable. That's just a fact of life. You can't cure everything. There are some diseases that do not have cures. Um, but at the very least, you can exert a bit of a placebo effect um, just through your attitude and from the way you treat uh, your patients.
And the last thing I want to touch on is the effect of exercise on immunity. Um, a sedentary lifestyle appears to have an immunosuppressive effect. In other words, if you just sit at home, eat potato chips and watch TV and don't move around a lot, um, you will tend to be immunosuppressed, you'll tend to get sick more often, you'll tend to end up in hospital more often. An exact reason for this hasn't been uh, clearly sort of figured out, but it possibly is due to a lack of adrenaline secretion. Your body never has a reason to secrete adrenaline because it never really needs to upregulate its metabolism in order to exercise or move, and therefore your adrenaline goes down and then your immune system um, cells uh, also become lazy and fat, as it were, and they sit uh, in your bloodstream watching TV eating potato chips. On the other hand, excess exercise um, puts excess physical stress on the human body and then you're going to have increased cortisol secretion and that in and of itself has an immunosuppressive effect. So athletes and sportsmen, for example, uh, tend to get more infections, especially upper respiratory tract infections like, um, far uh, like uh, pharyngitis, um, than um, your normal population, especially during periods of heavy training. So the sweet spot uh, where exercise benefits your immune system is with moderate exercise, not too much, not too little. And by definition, moderate exercise can even just include regular 30-minute brisk walks. You don't have to go to the gym and run the comrades and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Even just 30-minute uh, walks uh, three to four times a week is enough to give the, um, some benefits uh, to your immune system. Um, Basically, you're going to have um, the, fo uh, the f well. The following things have been found to uh, have been stimulated by moderate exercise. You're going to have higher levels of T cells, higher levels of B cells, higher levels of antibodies. Um, they're going to have better activity of macrophage and neutrophil phagocytosis. They're going to be able to eat pathogens much more easily, and you have a decrease in the amount of circulating pro-inflammatory molecules. And it's probably uh, the benefits are still, it's are still unclear why exercise has these benefits, but it's probably a combination of the fact that exercise, moderate exercise is relaxing, so you have less cortisol secretion, and moderate exercise stimulates a bit of adrenaline secretion, so you have that um, boost in, uh, for example, phagocytosis uh, in the macrophage ages and neutrophils, not so much to cause too much um, uh, secretion of cytokines, but just enough to stimulate the uh, activity. And uh, with the reduction in cortisol from relaxation, you're not going to kill off your immature T cells and B cells, so you're going to have more of them, and you're not going to have suppression of your B cell activity, so you're going to have more antibodies. So as you can see, this lecture was a bit of a schlep to prepare, and I have two full pages of references. This is my first page. 
and here is my second page of references. I hope that you managed to learn something worthwhile in this um, lecture on immunology. I've tried to keep it simple yet practical and clinically relevant. Uh, not so. Uh, it's not just about knowledge, but also helping you become better doctors in the future.